Today I'm going to run you through the Roland SRE 555 Chorus Echo from 1982. And I'll be putting a few different sounds through the unit a little later, so feel free to skip the tutorial using the index markers or shortcut chapters in the description area below if you're not here for the overview. These also came in the form of the RE501. Basically they're the same unit, the only difference is that the 555 is in this metal rack mountable frame opposed to the 501's Tolex covered wooden box. And sadly these represent the last of Roland's tape echo era before Roland moved on to developing digital delays. But there's something sentimental about these old mechanical boxes that I really like. And in this clip I'll demonstrate why. If you like it, hit the thumbs up, subscribe and check out the channel for more walkthroughs just like this one. If you haven't had the chance to play with a real tape echo before, definitely try to jump on one as they're a lot of fun to mess around on. This one's built like a tank, as you can see, despite a few battle scars. And to describe how these work, there's a little motor inside generally referred to as a capstan that circulates this continuous piece of magnetic tape, much like cassette tape, around a small circuit with tape heads and spindles along the tape's path. And much like an old cassette deck, there's a record head that prints your audio as particles onto that magnetic tape. And as the tape circles around, those particles will arrive at a playhead, and at that point they're converted back into audio. But it's that tiny delay, that moment between the record head and the playhead, that gives you or the listener the impression you've just heard an echo. On top of that, there's also little filters at work in there as well filtering the signal and reducing the level so that as the tape progresses around, the impression of the audio image with the help of the filtering becomes distant or fades. And similar to a photocopy from a photocopy machine, if you copy the copy repeatedly, say four or five times, that generational loss of quality is kind of what goes on inside a tape echo. But it does that a little more tastefully in such a way that your sound becomes a ghost of itself which is really quite pleasing to the ear. So with the combination of those mechanics plus the condition of the tape as well as the tape saturation all these processes taking place leave quite a footprint on the reproduction of your original audio going in and that's what really separates these delay units from the digital delays or plugins that are mostly trying to imitate those mechanical characteristics inside one of these units. Okay, so just one other thing to mention on tape heads before we move on. Another cool feature they have is playing back on multiple playheads simultaneously around different locations of the tape's path. And by doing that, add multiple impressions of delays onto your audio signal. And this is more modernly referred to as multi-tap delays. You can adjust your repeat rate knob to speed up or slow down the motor, which controls how quickly or how slowly the tape is circulating inside, and in turn, controlling how frequently you hear your echoes. And if you have any DJing skills, you can more or less beat mix the speed of your echo to an incoming beat or tempo. Then there's this feedback control labeled intensity, and this more or less feeds your signal from the playhead back to the record head, which then generates another point of echo to your audio on tape. And then configuring the repeat switch along with the intensity knob, you can dial in one echo or many, provided that your repeat switch is set upwards to repeat. And depending on if you want to have a single instance of echo, which would be all the way left on the intensity dial, opposed to many echoes by dialing up in the opposite direction, the real fun starts when you dial in so much intensity that it causes the unit to feed the audio back onto itself, which is what the term feedback is all about. Some may refer to that as self-oscillation, but whichever term you use, that feedback is capable of generating some pretty wild and crazy effects. And then while it's feeding back, you can adjust the repeat rate, which will either speed up or slow down the speed of the tape, along with your audio that's on there but in doing so, will warp the pitch of the audio along with it. But probably wise to mention, if you intend to have more than a single echo, then make sure your repeat switch is set upwards to repeat, 
otherwise the intensity won't be able to produce any self-oscillation, aka feedback. You can use both A and B unbalanced outputs to provide a stereo-like chorus image with this particular effect. It's not a true stereo image. Uh, it's more or less the direct signal and then the affected signal. But nonetheless, you can still make it sound a little bit wider by using both A and B unbalanced outputs. Let's jump across to the sound on sound echo. By default, this feature is allocated to the B unbalanced output and along with the volume knob, you dial in exactly how much level you need. And it should be said that this feature has its own dedicated playhead, but the effect is a little different to the alternate echoes also found on here. And it's rather like a raw method of looping an audio snippet, not so much an echo, but probably best described as what's commonly referred to these days as a looper. So you can more or less create continuous loops on the tape and the length of the loop will be determined by your repeat rate dial, which is basically the time the tape will take to complete one full cycle around the loop. When the repeat rate is at its slowest, one cycle around, or one tape loop, will take almost two seconds to complete, or all the way up as fast as the motors can run, will complete a cycle in roughly half a second. And the thing to note is, you'd only really make use of the sound on sound, or S on S, in conjunction with the repeat switch set upward, which produces continuous repetitions of whatever particular audio signal you put in. Alternatively, set your repeat switch to single for a single repetition, or what I call budgie mode. A sound on sound looper can generate some cool industrial effects and can be useful in sound design or anything where syncing to a time or beat isn't really necessary. And then moving along to the reverb, these are the infamous spring reverbs you've probably heard on countless dub and reggae songs. In fact, many used to simulate thunder by turning the reverb all the way up and then kicking or slapping the unit. And you'd hear the amplified spring bouncing around the inside of its enclosure, sounding more like a slinky on steroids having a tantrum in a toolbox. But that created all kinds of thunderous crashing noises. So next time you see one of these with a footprint on it, you know why. And look, I don't really condone or recommend that kind of operation with your unit, but go ahead and try that with a digital <laughs> reverb. Just kidding. All right, so the output of the reverb by default is the unbalanced output A. You have these two tone controls allowing bass and treble to be adjusted. Then there's the direct switch, which is generally referred to as the dry signal. And with this set on, your original audio signal can be heard uh, opposed to when it's switched off, you'll just hear the wet signal at the main output. And by default, your direct signal is allocated to the A output. And it should be said that all these features can be heard just via the unbalanced A output or XLR output if you've only got one cable connected. But you can get a little more from the unit when using A and B outputs in conjunction with each other as some features can be used separately, like in a dual mono configuration, or in the case of the chorus, a pseudo stereo configuration. As mentioned earlier, you have the repeat or single switch, which allows the echo or sound on sound effect to repeat continuously, opposed to just once when set to single. And repeat works in conjunction with the intensity, aka feedback dial, but the single switch will override the intensity value so be careful flicking back from single to repeat. Maybe check where your intensity dial is before switching so you don't get an earful of uh, feedback. Now we'll get to the important part of what these echo settings are all about. And the good thing is, now that we've touched on the playheads inside the unit, these numbers should make a little more sense to you in that they're kind of like IDs for your playheads. First, we'll set the volume for our echo, which is the same volume dial that controls the sound on sound level here. And starting from the first setting, number one, this is the first playhead where you would hear the signal played back by the closest playhead to the record head or the shortest distance. Probably a good option for a quick slapback kind of delay. Number two is the second playhead where you would hear the signal played back not as soon as the first playhead, but just after. Or you could consider that as your moderately paced delay. And then number three is the third playhead, 
which is the head furthest from the record head in relation to the echo circuit. And then number four, the fourth playhead? Wrong. The sound on sound feature actually uses the fourth playhead exclusively. And so setting number four is actually a multi-mode combining heads one and two for a multi-tap delay effect. And so number five is another multi-mode combining playheads two and three. And then at number six, we have the final multi-mode, combining all three playheads, one, two, and three. Last but not least, we have the remote switches that can be used with the Roland DP2 or compatible pedal, and you can enable or disable all the effects using the jack furthest to the left, labeled effects or you can toggle the on-off status of each of the individual elements marked in the cancel remote area here, indicated by these orange lines. There's also a Roland FS3 foot pedal that has three switches and three jacks on it that can cater to these three main effect components comfortably. Plus the repeat slash single switch can be toggled with a compatible foot pedal too. And so now we've covered most of the operational side of the unit, I thought I'd demonstrate how the tape echo or chorus echo influences a few different sounds. And to do that, I thought maybe we can start with some 8-bit goodness from the Emu Emulator 2.
So now maybe we can go for a different texture this time. Let's try some analog goodness from the Jupiter 6.
So now let's try something a little more modern, like an MPCX, with various samples and rhythms. Cool, well that was loads of fun. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, let me know by punching the thumbs up and tag subscribe for more funky junk coming soon. Um, oh, before I forget, check out the Tone Lab profile on Instagram and come join the Tone Lab group on Facebook for tech tips, troubleshooting, and all kinds of cool content. Links are in the description area below. Be cool, take care, thanks for watching, and bye for now.